Father Almighty God, we thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for everything that you've done for us since the beginning of the year. We bless your holy name, Lord, that little by little, two months are gone. By your special grace, we are still alive and well. And we know by your special grace, by your mercy, we will continue to be well. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Lord God Almighty, please continue to be merciful to us, be merciful to our families, be, fam be merciful unto your church, and please be merciful to your nation. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. We will continue with our study on going higher. As we move on to part 10, going higher part 10, our text will remain 1 Kings chapter 17 from verse 2 to 6. 1 Kings 17 from verse 2 to 6. As we begin to learn more about lessons from the Brook Cherith, section 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. We've already learned some lessons from the sojourn of Elijah by the brook Cherith. We've learned that God is unlimited We've learned that God is faithful. We want to continue with our lessons as we consider the fact that God knows your address. He knows your location. He knows where you are at any particular time. There were many brooks but there's only one brook called Cherith. God knows your address. Acts chapter 9, from verse 10 to 19. Acts 9, 10 to 19. When God was sending um, Ananias to Saul of Tarsus, he told him exactly where he was located. Yes, he said to him, there's a man called Saul of Tarsus. Not Saul of Damascus, but right now, he's in Damascus, he's in this particular street, he's in this particular man's house, 
That's where you will meet him. God knows your address. In Acts chapter 10 from verse 1 to 6, Acts 10 from verse 1 to 6, when God was sending Cornelius to Peter, he gave him the correct address. God knows your address. He said, hey, go and look for this man. He's staying with such and such a man. The house is beside the sea. He gave full details. Because in those days, they didn't have uh, house numbers. But God can still describe your house accurately. This leads us to one very important information, and that is that your miracle cannot miss its way. Amen. There's no way God can be sending a miracle to you and it will go to the wrong address. No way. No way at all. Even if you try to hide, your miracle will locate you. First Samuel chapter 10, verse 17 to 24. First Samuel chapter 10, from verse 17 to 24. The day that Saul was to be enthroned as king, he went to hide. Let they fish them out. Even if you are trying to hide, God will still locate you. You know, he made a promise in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. He said, if only you will just hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all that he commands you. He said, blessings will be pursuing you and overtaking you. In other words, you might be running away from blessings. The blessings will pursue you. They will run faster than you, and they will overtake you. I was sharing with my children, in one of our morning devotions in the open heavens, I said, God can bless you to such an extent that you will say to God, God, this is too much. Can we go slow a bit? I said, with all humility, I've had to say that to God before. Father, I, I'm becoming embarrassed with your blessings. What he said to me is simple. Sand, you want the blessings to stop, then stop living holy. As long as you are living holy, you haven't seen anything yet. And I'm saying to all of you who are true children of the living God, if only you can just keep on living holy, God will bless you beyond your capacity to receive. Your miracles cannot miss it. They are way. Even if you are trying to hide, they will fish you out. If you are kept out of sight by people who don't like you, your miracle will see, say, go and bring him. First Samuel 16, from verse 1 to 13. First Samuel 16, from verse 1 to 13. It was David that God wanted to make king. His father didn't present him. But the man of God said, we will not sit down until you bring that boy. All those that the almighty God will use to bless you, if they are dragging their feet, they won't be able to rest. Amen until they have done what God wants them to do. If you are kept out of sight, your miracle will say, bring him out. And if you try to dodge, 
the miracle will still compel you. Exodus chapter 3, you can read it from verse 1. Exodus 3, verse 1, all the way to Exodus chapter 4, verse 20. Exodus 4, verse 20. God said, Moses, your time has come to fulfill destiny. Moses said, no way. I'm no longer interested. I am not going. He gave all manners of excuses. God gave him miracles upon miracles. He said, hey, send somebody else. I said, you are trying to dodge. You are wasting your time. Your miracle has come. My time will go to Exodus 4, verse 20. Moses left for Egypt, carrying the miracle walking power of God with him. You can dodge the miracle of God. He will locate you. The miracle will not miss its way. But not only that, this is even more serious, it is that nothing can tamper with your miracle. Nothing. Isn't it interesting that the bears didn't eat part of the bread on the way? Isn't it interesting? Is it not interesting that they didn't eat part of the flesh? Is it not interesting that they did not come in the morning and failed to come in the evening? That they didn't miss a single appointment? We interest you to know, at least in Africa, I don't know the rest of the world, when we are talking about birds, that could be symbolic of demonic forces. <laughs> when we want to call someone, at least in my own part of the country, when we want to say somebody is a witch, <laughs> we say, she's a bird. Uh, that's a polite way of saying, <laughs> hey, you don't want to mess with her. The morning forces cannot interfere with your miracles. Amen. Impossible. Oh, they may cause some delays, but my faithful God will come true. Amen. Luke chapter 8 from verse 1 to 3. Luke chapter 8 from verse 1 to 3. Mary Magdalene had seven demons operating in her. But she was created to be a divine treasurer. When the time came, God chased out the demons. In Mark chapter 5, verse 2 to 19, Mark 5, 2 to 19, the madman of Gadara, his own case wasn't even seven demons. He was a legion. But he was created to be an evangelist. When the time came, his miracle located him where he was staying in the tomb. I decree today, every evil force that has been blocking your way, this day, they will be scattered. Amen. Relatives cannot stop your miracle. Oh, yes, the Lord himself said that a man's foes will be dairy of his household. Yes, many of us know how many enemies we have in our families. But that is not going to stop you. They can't, they can't tamper with your miracles. I mean, Genesis 37 from verse 16 to 28. Genesis 37 from verse 16 to 28. The brothers of Joseph said, here comes the dreamer. Let's kill him and see what will happen to his dream. 
They didn't succeed in killing him, so they sold him into slavery. They were only helping him on. And I know many of you who are alive today only by the special grace of God, because left to your relatives, <laughs> you'll be dead by now. I mean, there was the story of a man who hired killers to kill his younger brother when the brother discovered. Fortunately, he escaped death. When he discovered, he said, why? I was taking care of you. I was supplying all your needs. He said, hey, that's the problem. I'm the elder. You are the younger. So you are angry for the fact that I'm taking care of you? Every enemy in your family, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, they will live to see your glory. They will come and bow before your God. Yeah. Your boss cannot tamper with your miracle. No. He may try, but he won't succeed. Genesis 39, if you read it from verse 1 to 32. Genesis 39 from verse 1 to 32. It was the wife of the boss of Joseph who conspired against Joseph and got him thrown to jail. Man, they were just helping him on. They were just helping him on. No boss can stand between you and your miracle. I mean, I still remember the story of that fellow who said to one of my children, as long as I'm here, you will not be promoted. Hmm? And my son told me, I said, that's no problem. A simple prayer will handle the matter. God said, if you say to a mountain, be moved. The mountain shall be moved. So we prayed a simple prayer. And they transferred the boss. And after they transferred the boss, they promoted my boy to the position of the boss. And then they brought the boss back. And the two of them were now at the same level. Is there any boss who is saying that you won't reach your goal? God will transfer him. Amen. <laughs> he will be relocated. Amen. There is no authority. It doesn't matter the rank that can tamper with your miracle. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 10 to 12, 1 Samuel 18, verse 10 to 12, King Saul tried to pin David to the wall with a javelin. The javelin missed. Anyone in authority who is trying to pin you to the wall, the javelin will miss. Amen. Why? Because there is no one who can close the door that God has opened. Revelation chapter 3. From verses 7 and 8, I mean from verse 7 to 8, Revelation 3, 7 to 8, he said, I, I have the keys of David. When I open, no man can shut. When I shut, no man can open. That's my God. In Isaiah 43, verse 13, Isaiah 43, verse 13, he said, I will walk. Who can hinder me? There is nobody who can keep you down when God says he wants to pull you up. Nobody. Mark chapter 2, from verse 1 to 12. Mark chapter 2, from verse 1 to 12. They brought a man to him, to Jesus Christ, through the roof. And then the Lord saw their faith and said to the man, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Ah. And the people began to murmur, Who is this man who is forgiven sin? Jesus ignored them. 
Say, I know what you are talking about. I know what you are thinking, but it doesn't matter. Young man, get up. The entire congregation could not put him down when God says, get up. And I'm decreeing the name that's above every other name to every one of you, true children of God. Get up. Amen. You see, it is written in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Romans 8, 31. And I've preached a sermon on that before. If you like, you can locate the tape. It simply says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Because in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 15 to 17, Isaiah 54 from verse 15 to 17, God said, hey, they may gather together to discuss you, to plan, to plot against you. They may gather together, but not of me. And those who gather together against you, they will fall because of you. Amen. And then he went further, he said, every instrument of destruction. I'm the one who gave the fellow, the, the hard, the, the habalis, the, the one who put all this thing together to do their evil work. When they put it together against you, he says it's not going to prosper. Amen. If God be for us, who can be against us? Like I said in a sermon I preached on that one years ago, people will shout, nobody. I said, hey, hold on, no. <laughs> they didn't write nobody there. Just put question mark. Because there's only one fellow who can stop your upward movement, and that's you. Only you can stop your upward movement. In 2 Kings chapter 5, from verse 20 to 27, 2 Kings 5, from verse 20 to 27, we saw the story of Gehazi, one of the saddest stories in the Bible. Elisha was great. Gehazi would have been greater. But here was a man who was living and sleeping with the supernatural, and it, he was not affected by it. How sad will it be if one day they are writing your history, and they say for Sundays after Sundays after Sundays, you have been listening to a servant of the Most High God, who has been bringing you fresh manna every Sunday. And hey, look at you. Look at how you are ended. I pray that your story will not be a sad one. Gehazi could have been the most powerful prophet of the Old Testament. He could have t obtained a double portion of the anointing of Elisha. Instead, he got leprosy. He lived among the supernatural, but he wasn't affected by it. You alone can stop your upward climb. Therefore, please don't interfere with the plan of God. Don't interfere with the plan of God. Let God finish what he has started on his own. The Bible says that the one who began a good work in you can perfect it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians 1, verse 6. Let God be God. If he already started moving you upward, let him finish the job. For example, in 1 Samuel chapter 24, from verse 1 to 22, 1 Samuel 24, 
from verse 1 to 22. The Bible said, when David was running away from King Saul, a day came that David and his men were in a cave, and then Saul also came into the cave. He didn't know that uh, these boys were there. The friends of David, and you have to be careful of who are your friends, advise him and say, hey, this is the day you have been waiting for. Kill him now. And you, you will be on the throne. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. David said, no, 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 I'm not going to touch the anointed of God. I just got a bit of his dress to show him I was there. Read the story. It was so interesting. Because when finally David told, after Saul got out, and didn't know what had happened, and David called out to him and said, hey, your majesty, so and so happened. I, look, I caught a bit of your dress as evidence that I was this close to you. Listen to what King Saul said. He said, now I know you will be king. <laughs> he said, now I know I'm wasting my time trying to mess with your miracle. You will be king. All I'm begging you is that when you become king, you don't wipe out my family. If David had taken matters into his own hand, the story would be different today. The story would be different today. But let me go quickly to just one more little point about the sojourn of Elijah at Cherith. And that is this point, that any time that you spend alone with God, is not wasted time. That's a very, very important point. Because Elijah was at Cherith. There's nobody to talk to. <laughs> when the ravens come in the morning, hello, ravens. When they come in the evening, hello, ravens. But God was there. Why was he there alone with God? Because the taller the building is going to be, the deeper must be the foundation. If you have not been spending quality time alone with God, you are not likely to go too high. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me take him as the first example. In Luke chapter 2, from verse 42 to 52. Luke 2, two from verse 42 to 52. At the age of 12, he was already <laughs> dazzling the professors asking them questions, answering questions. They were amazed at his understanding of the scriptures. But <laughs> when the parents came and took him from there, I'm sure his father in heaven must have whispered to him, hey, your foundation is not deep yet. You need to go deeper. For another 18 years, he didn't preach a sermon. It was after another 18 years. In Matthew chapter 3, from verse 13 to 17, Matthew 3, 13 to 17, that he came to be baptized. And even after the baptism, God sent him into the wilderness to go and fast and pray for 40 days and nights. Matthew chapter 4, from verse 1 to 11. Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Then he did the examinations. 
to find out if he's truly ready for the ministry. And he didn't stop there. You will notice, in, for example, in Matthew 14, Matthew 14, verse 23, Matthew 14, verse 23, that a great good lady, he will go aside to be alone with God. Learn to spend time alone with God. Let your foundation go really deep. A tall tree must have a very strong tap root. And some of us who think we already know all there is to know, you don't know anything yet. You don't know anything as you ought to know. That's what the Bible says. Take another example. Take Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 to 19. Galatians 1, 15 to 19. As soon as he was converted, as soon as Ananias came, laid hands on him, his eyes opened, he got meat, he began to preach. So much that uh, the people around wanted to kill him. But God said, hey, thank you, uh, Paul, or whatever you call your soul or tassels or Paul. You need time alone with me for three solid years. It was in Arabia. Alone with God. Spend quality time. At the end of the day, he wrote at least a third of the New Testament. You need time with God because your foundation must be solid if you are to go high. Let me conclude with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. If you are not in Christ, you don't even have any foundation at all. Because the Bible says there's no other foundation that is laid than that which is already laid, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation. Until you are born again, you have no foundation at all. So if you think you are growing high, and you are not in Christ. Uh, I pray you will pay attention to what the elders say. The African elders. They say when the ant falls, nobody hears the sound. They say when the cockroach falls, the ground does not tremble. But when an elephant falls, they will feel the impact not only in the bush, but in the village. So if you are growing tall and you have no foundation, when the storm comes and you hit the ground, everybody will learn a lesson. Connect to Jesus Christ, the solid foundation. And then, it doesn't matter what flood may come, you will stand firm. As for those of us who are already children of God, please learn this lesson. Time spent alone with God is not wasted time. It's putting your root deeper and deeper into the ground so that you'll be able to go higher and higher still. Let us pray. Those of you who will want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, I want to advise you now, come to him. He is the true foundation. You need a solid foundation if you are to grow high. Surrender to him now. Ask him to please, please save your soul, receive you into his family, and your foundation will begin 
And from now on, things will begin to move higher for you. As for those of us who are already children of God, please learn your lesson and spend quality time from now on alone with God in prayer. Let us pray. And Father, my God, I want to thank you once again for your word, and I want to give you all glory and honor for everything that we have learned again today. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. As for all your children who are surrendering to you now, please receive them, save their souls, wash them clean. And please, Lord God Almighty, receive them into the family of God as you write their names in the book of life so that any time they cry unto you, you answer them by fire. Please, Lord, as for all your children, I've told them that nothing can tamper with their miracles. Let their miracles locate them today and let them have testimonies. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, those of you who gave your life to Jesus, please contact me as soon as possible so that I can be praying for you. And try and locate a redeemed Christian church of God. You'll find one near you, no doubt about that. And ask the pastor there, uh, what next can you do? to grow in the Lord. God bless you all. Amen. Praise the Lord.